Um, I would say, no doubt, a very long, uh, extensive answer could be given, but to keep things brief, uh, Ali, you mentioned accountability. Um, but uh, Abu Osama, Abu Zubair, um, and uh, Abu Zaina, they just mentioned accountability in general. Now I want to finally tune the term or the concept of accountability. My humble opinion, the accountability cannot be aimed at one direction. It can't just be one direction, one party, one class of accountability. I feel that the accountability has to be divided three times or spread out in three classes of people. Accountability of the scholar, accountability of the da'iya, the da'i, the da'i, the student of knowledge, the imam, the imam, he has to be accountable, the translator, and the layman nine to five Muslim, you, not all of you, but in general, you're accountable as well. And it's not just the fault of the scholar. Can't just blame it on the sheikh. The sheikh is evil. The sheikh has destroyed our community. The sheikh, the sheikh, the sheikh, the sheikh, he has brought no good to our community. Perhaps. But there's accountability for you. You didn't memorize Sahih Bukhari. You didn't study in Yemen. You didn't go to Egypt. But you do have a brain. Allah gave you basic common sense. Which is a genius and work clothes, as they say. A genius and work clothes is common sense. Good, solid common sense. And the student of knowledge and the translator also has accountability. Some people say it's the sheikh's words. Okay, they are, but you translated it. Everybody understand this? The sheikh said it. I'm just giving you what the scholar says, but you're accountable. You're held responsible for the validity of your translation, for translating everything that he said, and for also giving the sheikh valid, accurate information. When all three tiers are in cohesive movement, they be the night ta'ala, the system is going to be thorough. Everyone is accountable. What the Sheikh says, how it was presented to the people, and how you respond. If you allow a man, and this is, once again, this is no disrespect to anybody, but this is the truth. If you allow a man, if I ask you a question, hypothetically, Sheikh Fulan, and I'm not talking about one scholar. If you think it's talking about one scholar, then we're, put on a shoe if you feel that it fits. What does Sheikh Fulan look like? If I ask many of you, some of you made Omras, mm -hmm. but what does he look like? You wouldn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. If the sheikh walked in the door and walked by, you think it's mm -hmm. some old man. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have a clue what he looks like. What's his kunya? What, did he, what does he specialize? You don't know anything about this sheikh. And you allow him to dictate, to become a dictator and to control and rule your community. And separate and split up and divide and destroy and demolish. That's your fault. That's your fault. And you can't blame that on the sheikh. Everybody understand this? A student of knowledge who's just a donkey, an ass that carries around books. The Sheikh said, this one said, I translated without using his mind and the basic skills that Allah gave him. That's his fault. And a scholar who allows people to manipulate him and to use him as a weapon against their enemies, their opponents, their adversaries. That's his fault for allowing himself to be manipulated and to be used. Everybody's accountable and everyone is going to be held responsible on the day of judgment. So that's first and foremost. Accountability is not just for a scholar. It's your fault too. It's your fault. It's your fault, sister. It's your fault for allowing it to happen and allowing it to take place again and again and again and again. It can't be an accident. It's impossible for 20 years to go by and the same thing to just be an accident. It's a program. It's a system. But you allowed it. Hmm. You allowed it. Lord the student Lord. knowledge and the scholar. Everyone's accountable. That's first and foremost. Now. Not to take too much time up. Uh, no, continue. Mm. All means. <laughs> we here. Let's make a few examples, inshallah. Allah says in the Quran al Kareem, in the tenth chapter, in the tenth chapter, Surah Yunus, and it, towards the end of the surah, Allah in the Oliya Allah ila khofan alayhim wa lahum yahsanun. Allah dina amunu wa kanu yatakum. Lahum al bushra fil hayat al dunya wa fil akhira. La tabadil li kalimat Allah hidalik wa al fawzul alzim. Allah says, indeed, for sure, the awliya, this word says, awliya, pro of wali. And we'll translate what that means later on and interpret it. The walis of Allah will have no fear and no sadness and no grief whatsoever. Who are the walis of Allah? As, as if someone asked the question, Allah says, alladina amanu, those who used to believe, wa kanu yattaqum, and they had taqwa. Allah then says in the next ayah, لَهُمْ الْبُشْرَى فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ For theirs is glad tidings in this life and in the hereafter. 
لا تبديل لكلمة الله. No one can change what Allah has said. ذلك هو الفوز العظيم. Allah says, indeed, that is the great success. In a well-known hadith, you all know, it says that Allah Azza wa Jal said, من عاد لي وليا فقد آذنته بالحرب. Anyone who abuses, who annoys, anyone who aggravates, anyone who disrespects one of my walis, I have announced warfare. A state of war exists between Allah and between this person who is disrespecting one of Allah's walis. And there are other ayats and other hadith about the walis of Allah. So who is the wali of Allah? The wali of Allah has many meanings. From its meanings is a friend, a close friend, someone who is loved, someone who is protected. Someone who's looked after, or look, he's going to look after this person, an ally. So the Quran tells us that the friends of Allah, the protected slaves of Allah, the chosen slaves of Allah, won't have any worries in this life or thereafter, period. So the wali in Islam has a tremendous status, according to the kitab and the sunnah. Now, what's the first book that you study when you accepted Islam? What's the first book that you study when you learned about Salafi Dawah, a Dawah to Salafiyah? Back in the mid 90s, late 90s, it was a Dawah to Salafiyah. Now it's just Salafiyah. Back then it was Salafi Dawah. The first book you studied, perhaps it was Surah Thalatha, Three Fundamental Principles of Islam. The first book you studied, Kitab al Tawheed, Aqidah wa so on and so forth. Who wrote these books? Who's the author of Ibn Abdul Wahab? Who's, who's the author? Ibn Abdul Wahab, correct? Ibn Abdul Wahab, Rahimahullah. Many people that he lived with. Many chieftains, many people of Arabia, their major problem, they had many, was the concept of the wali. The wali. And they said about Ibn Abdul Wahab is that he's disrespecting the walis. He's reviling the walis. He's going against the walis. These awliya, these friends of Allah, they have no status to this man, Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahab. You can't visit their graves, you can't kiss the walls of their graves, you can't swear by them, you can't slaughter for them, you can't make tawaf around their graves, you can't ask them for help, you can't wear a necklace with their names. He's disrespecting the walis of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any Muslim will say, ha, a'udhu billah, who would disrespect one of the awliya of Allah? La khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. Who's going to disrespect Allah's wali? So Ibn Abdul Wahhab rahimahullah ta'ala, the author of many books that you studied and memorized, he, what did he say? He says, I never disrespected a wali. He says, and I never said that the walis don't have a status. And I never said that they aren't special and protected Muslims. What I said was, is they are not equal with Allah. They're not similar to Allah. You cannot slaughter in their name. You cannot make tawaf around their graves. You cannot kiss the walls of their graves. Allah has a status like no other. And beneath that status is the status of the wali. For you to take an orange and an apple and mix them together, that's what my dawah is against. So anyone who says that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab says disrespect the walis has lied upon Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. And the proof is my books. Read my books to find what I believe about the walis. You wish to make shirk with this wali. You wish to take this wali as a rival with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is something that I am against. One of the main problems is not the concept of wali or shirk. We're not talking about it right now. It's to take the status of a scholar that Allah gave him. And that a messenger gave them. And to make that status above and beyond what Allah and His Messenger gave them. That is a huge problem. This is a scholar. <laughs> he is to be respected. No doubt about that. Mashallah. This is a scholar. You are to ask him if you don't know. As the Quran says. This is a scholar. You benefit from him. You have good thoughts for him. You make an excuse for him. That's Shep. No doubt about that. As far as you giving a scholar the power and the ability that Allah and His Messenger did not give him. Are you mixing and jumbling the right of the scholar with the right of this one and that one and a leader? Then that's where the flaw comes. So the brother, the student knowledge, who goes overseas and he says, I'm not disrespecting Sheikh Fulan. I'm not disrespecting him, but I just disagree. And I sat in the classes with Sheikh Fulan and what he said, Ibn Qayyim, this one, that one, that one. If they're wrong, go against them. And that's the true way of the Salaf Salih. Imam Malik said, everyone will be refuted, his statement will be accepted, except for the one in his grave. And he pointed to the Prophet's noble grave. That's what Imam Malik said. So this is what these scholars taught us. Not to be a donkey and an ass. Use your brain, O oh student of knowledge. So if I differ with this sheikh, and I feel that he's right and the sheikh is wrong, it doesn't mean that I've disrespected this scholar. It does not mean that I have no love for the scholars. But it means loving the scholar and following the truth are two different things. Respecting a scholar is in following the teachings of that scholar. And the scholar's teachings are to go back to your country, teach your people, don't follow anyone 
if they say something which is wrong. So you are mixing and matching things that don't belong, just like the people did with Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. To slaughter in the name of Allah than Allah is shirk akbar. To love the wali and say, may Allah have mercy upon him, be pleased with him, that's from iman and that's from tawheed. Don't mix the two. You can visit the graves, say, make dua for the people in the graves, don't call upon them. So that's a major problem and a major issue. The next point, then I tell you, before we stop, is with regards to the students of knowledge, mm -hmm. quote unquote, or the days of the translators. The best way to summarize it in a law item, because it's a very long, extensive issue, is that all those who have power fear to lose it. Hmm. All hmm. those who have power, they're afraid Allah of losing Allah. that power. Allah. Now, like you said, Abu Sama, Abu Zaina, rock star, hmm. right? Superstar. I'm a student of knowledge. Regardless of what I studied or what I didn't study, that I graduated or not, but I'm the clearest student of knowledge. I can marry any sister that I want to. I can have literally a revolving door of four wives, literally at my leisure. This sister, that sister, this sister, I want a younger one, an older one, a light skin one, a dark skin one, a thin one, a thick one, anyway. <laughs> this is no, this is reality. This is not a joke. This is real. Real talk. It's real. Real talk. Money, I want to go make Umrah. My Umrah ticket is paid for. I want a house, I want a car, I want this, I want that, food, fruit, tea, whatever you want. The fuck them. Now, before I accepted this land, not everybody, but many of us, we were nothing. Basically, a nobody. I come to this land, I go overseas, I graduate from a school, I'm a superstar, I'm a celebrity. Wherever I go, people know me. They invite me to come and eat lamb, marry my daughter. <laughs> BD, man, my community. This is reality. Literally. This is reality. Literally. So this person, if, he's, if he does have a pure heart, if Allah has purified him, do you think he's going to relinquish this power to somebody that's younger than him, smarter than him, more talented than him, an actual real student of knowledge <laughs> that's up at night reading and studying books as Ali Davis says, principles, rules, usul al-fiqh, he says, judicial law, not sharia. Me, I barely graduated. I barely studied. I barely speak Arabic. It's just like sports. They're the greats of the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. It's nothing like the athleticism of 2017. It's mm. nothing like this player who can play the power forwards, the small forward, shooting guard, he can play every position on the court. <laughs> the athleticism is nothing how it was back then. A 50 yard field goal was an accomplishment. Now people kicking 60, 65 yard field goals easily. The athleticism has evolved. So it's a different breed of student of knowledge. Now people are getting PhDs. People are getting master's degree. People are studying and benefiting. So what you did back in the day, perhaps it was good, it was sufficient. You did what you could. And the only knowledge back then was getting the phone to call a shape. Alhamdulillah. But it's a new day. A new sheriff is in town. <laughs> Don't be the hero too long that you see yourself to become the villain. No doubt. So, Learn when to bow out so and pass the, the, the torch the, the, on to someone else. The point else. is, the point is, Absolutely. is that if these, if these people don't, if they're not purified by law, they don't want to relinquish their power. So Abu Usama was a better speaker than me. He actually graduated. I just lived in Kuwait and I was an English teacher. He actually graduated, he has a degree. He can translate, he can give a lecture, he can give a khutbah, he can do all these marriage counseling. I don't want Abu Simon to take my position and my status. He's better than me, he looks better than me, he's cooler than me. I have to get rid of Abu Simon. This is a reality. So how can I get rid of him? I can't beat him in a fist fight. Uh. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> Can't be the leader this time. <laughs> what am I going to do? I'm going to do what now? I'm going to find a way to assassinate his character. Get rid of Call him. him. He said this. He did this. Call him Goldie. What I cut, what I paste. <laughs> he did mean it. He explained it. However, I get rid of it. That's what I'm going to do. When I call up the sheikh, yeah, sheikh, listen carefully. We have someone, not a graduate. Not an imam of a community, not a leader, not someone that took this hole in the wall, mashed it, and turned it into a major center. But we have someone who's called. You die, you some man, some majhul, ignorant guy, some nobody. We have someone who says this, who says kether, who says kether, who says kether. He's a Shia when it comes to the Sahaba. He's a Qadri when it comes to the predestiny. He's a Murjik when it comes to Iman, when it comes to the rulers. He's a Khawarij. Every bid'ah is in him. <laughs> this is real talk. That is real talk. So the scholar, like we said, the accountability, he's either going to give a general answer. I don't know who this person is. If what you're saying is true, then that's wrong, so on and so forth, stay away from him. 
Who is the person? Allah Alam with the scholars want to say. The point is, is that there are many reasons, there are many causes. From them is people being afraid, people being inferior, people being jealous, and people being envious. They mention here about being on a pedestal and you never thought, that wasn't how I came up. People always envied me. I wasn't a deviant back then, but it was always tension because I was so young. And the brothers that would shake my hand, we would sit, drink tea together, and people that would talk about me behind my back. So the point is, is that in 2002, and I'm going to leave you with this, I was sitting in the Prophet's Masjid with Sheikh Abdul Masin al Abad. And they asked him a question, and perhaps the name of the person most of us can't even pronounce. They said, Yeah, Sheikh. Sheikh Abdul Masin al Abad is the grandfather of, of Medina. He's the teacher of all of the scholars of Medina. Sheikh Rabid himself studied with him for two years. They asked Sheikh Abdul Hassan, this is 2002 now, Yeah, Sheikh, what about the tabdeer of Abu Hassan al Halabi, uh, Abu Hassan Ma'rabi, so on and so forth? The Sheikh didn't say Sheikh Rabi is right, Sheikh Rabi is this, Sheikh Rabi is a great, he didn't say any of that. He says all of these issues are based off of, he says, Ahwaf al Nufus. No. He says, per Now, you're shaking your head and saying, Nah, now. No. In 2002? In 2002? I wasn't. I wouldn't have agreed no. with that. I didn't. At all. I didn't disrespect the Sheikh, I'm like, Hey, how you gonna say that, Sheikh? <laughs> that is all personal. That is all personal. Fifteen years later, only Allah knows what became clear, what became manifest. Their brothers in the college can ask. I saw the gradual development, and those words were as clear as day. And the same thing has happened and is happening in America. The only reason why you are looking for the mistakes of Shadid, if he did make a mistake, maybe he did make a mistake. Maybe. The only reason why you are looking for them is because you're jealous. The only reason why you're looking to find what Abu Usama said is because you're insecure and inferior. You're afraid Abu Usama is better than you and he's going to take your power and your authority. And then comes the game, so on and so forth. So this is in brief. This is in brief. This is not everything. The most important thing that I want to give you guys is just look at what happened. Abu Usama mentioned about the scholars from Jordan. Abu Usama, Ali Halabi, Musa Nasser, Hussein Awaisha. Usama Kusi from Egypt, QSS, they came to America, came to America, came to Canada. What happened to those scholars? They became deviants. But our Phillips, this one, that one, burn his books, get rid of his tapes. You accepted Islam, you made Tarabiyah, you grew your beard, you put on hijab, you left Kufr, you left Shirk, you came to the deen, now get rid of all of his books. And then another scholar comes, he's a deviant now. And then this one comes from Bahrain, and this one, and this one, and that one. How long are you going to be stupid? How long are you going to see that it's a big game and it's a big joke? And you're the victim of it. You're on the, the, the shortest end of the stick. You can't build, you can't make nothing consistent upon someone teaching you, benefiting your soul, and then burn all of his books. Mm -hmm. So you're held accountable as well. That's in brief. Allahu <laughs> Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Take me out. MashaAllah. <laughs> If we didn't say anything else tonight, you have cut kufitum. You have been sufficed. Abu Sami, you wanted to say something? Okay. All right. So we'll make this my my last question. Uh, and like you guys, you get it now. Is it clear to you now? Is it clear? I'm I'm hoping that it's clear. This is the, the benefit of asking questions. Asking questions is actually a form of teaching, right? And the hadith of Jibril, who was the teacher? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Jibreel? Jibreel. Jibreel. And Jibreel never gave anything more than a question. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Umar, Atadri man is sa'in. Do you know who the questioner was? Umar said, Wallahu wa rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and his messenger knows best. He said, Hadha Jibreel atakum yu'allimukum umur adinikum. That was Jibreel who came to teach you your religion. Jibreel never said anything except to ask the question. أخبرني عن الإسلام أخبرني عن الإيمان وأخبرني عن الإحسان. Tell me about Islam, tell me about Iman, and tell me about Ihsan. And because of that, the Prophet ﷺ called Jibreel the teacher. So what we are doing right now, class is in session. Make no mistake about that. My last question, 